Maurice Richard n'est plus. Le Québec pleure sa plus grande idole. Maurice, the rocket Richard is dead. The hockey legend's death was announced. Le français vient de perdre une légende. Maurice Richard, c'est l'histoire du Canadien de Montréal et c'est aussi l'idole de... The new millennium in hockey begins with an ending. Maurice Richard's death in May of 2000 at the age of 78 confirms his status as next to God in Quebec. In 1937, another of Les Glorieux, Howie Morenz, lay in state at the Forum. Now, it's Richard's turn. More than 100,000 of his fans want to see number nine one last time. Gabriel Labbé was a child recovering from tuberculosis when he first met Richard. A magical specter dancing through the radio in the darkness of a hospital ward. The rocket's gift was of courage and hope, and it would grow into a friendship that would last a lifetime. Gabriel even named his son Richard. But now, the rocket is gone. And Labbé, who lives not far from the Molson Center, isn't sure he can bear this truth in person. I'm not very well, and I wasn't going to go. But then I felt something like a force that was out of the ordinary, you know? I had to go. My legs were weak. I said to myself, it can't be. We knew that he was very sick, but we always said, it's the rocket. He'll make it. With the departure of the rocket, we've come to the last page in the book. There's nothing left. The sense of loss, of grieving, on this late spring day goes well beyond one man. To his mourners, to many of his fans, the game that Richard gave life to is also gone. In little more than a hundred years, this game, born of winter, of survival, has come to be the soul of a nation. Now, as the millennium turns, it is time for soul searching. Corruption and complacency are the symptoms of a creeping malaise infecting the game. The defeats at the Nagano Olympics stand as merely the most visible reminder of what needs to be done. Time to take stock and take action. The steps are painful and often controversial as Canada sets out to reclaim the game. Minor hockey continued to grow in popularity in the 1990s. Call it the Gretzky bounce. By the middle of the decade, more than half a million players were registered. With girls taking to the ice as never before. But with the game's rapid growth, the stakes got higher. There was competition for ice time, for qualified coaches and referees, and of course, there was always the pressure to win. Minor hockey was stretched to the point of snapping. Minor hockey, I, I completely see where we've run amok with it. And, it, and it is all based on two things, winning and the idea that you'll be set for life with a great amount of money. That has corrupted the game uh, horribly. That's not to say kids love to win. They, they absolutely play to win, and so they should. 
but they should accept defeat, and more important, their parents should accept defeat, and, and I can't for the life of me figure out why, why we don't. An incident during a university playoff game in 1996 became a flashpoint. Cameras captured the unthinkable. University of Moncton players attacking a referee after he allowed a disputed goal in overtime. The incident so shocked the university that it called in Ken Dryden to investigate. It frightened me. You do not touch a referee. It didn't matter the circumstance. No explanation could obscure the point. You didn't do it, period. Ken Dryden, the lanky Montreal Canadiens goaltender, hung up his skates in 1979 after a career that produced five Vesna trophies as the NHL's best goalie and six Stanley Cups in eight years. But he never left the game. And in the 90s, he emerged as an outspoken reformer in a game smothered by inertia. Now, a line had been crossed, a code broken. Dryden's report pointed to a game that had lost its moral compass. We've got to find a way to turn down the heat. The code, you do not touch a referee, is more and more at risk. The Moncton case wasn't isolated. Minor hockey refs were abused and assaulted. 16, sit down. It wasn't just the players. Coaches and parents, too, seemed unable to turn down the heat. The spirit, the tone, the approach starts to shift from a kid's tone and an atmosphere to a parent's. Then it becomes the parent's experience almost as much as it becomes the kid's experience. And as parents invested more and expected greater returns, rink rage entered the lexicon. You had a, a lot of rink rage. Uh, the word hockey parent, it's almost like one word now and it conveys all sorts of negative things. There's a man in jail in Massachusetts right now on, on a manslaughter conviction because he killed someone or, or someone died as a result of a, a confrontation in the lobby of a hockey rink over a kid's game. A win-at-all-costs attitude dominated a game that children play. Ken Dryden pressed Hockey Canada to call a summit meeting. There are certain tough moments that really cause you to look inside and look really hard and deep. From all across the country, from NHL players to minor hockey volunteers, anyone with a passion for the game was invited to the Open Ice Summit in the summer of 1999. The response was overwhelming. A brush fire of concern from across the country. Everyone looking for a way to reclaim the game. A summer day in Toronto, 1999. The scene of quite possibly the most important hockey conference ever convened in Canada. Ken Dryden chairs it. For him, no less than the game's future is at stake. If fewer kids play, will hockey remain a Canadian passion? Why do we just talk? Why do we say the same things, make the same recommendations, and nothing gets done? Maybe. One of those attending open ice is Steve Larmer, a former NHL player who grew up in Peterborough. He's got his own ideas about what's wrong with hockey. He wants to make the game fun again, like it was for him as a kid. You know, somebody made minor hockey a very good experience for me. We'll have more time to do that breakaway drill at the end that you like doing. Yeah! And it's nice to, to be able to give that back. Good job, Mike. That's the way to stop and get it. Larmer joins forces with Ed Arnold, 
the local newspaper editor and longtime hockey coach in the Peterborough Pete system, to teach eight-year-olds a new approach, less structure, more creativity. At first, parents are skeptical, but the kids love it. We don't care if these kids make a mistake. We want them skating. If, if it doesn't work this time, it might work the next time, but keep that attitude of I can, I can, I can. While Steve Larmer was putting fun back in the game in Peterborough, hockey visionaries across the country took steps to keep it that way by reining in rough play. The defenseur du pas comme ça. Ça vient ici, ça vient là. Richard Jameson is the coach of Petite Nation, a team of 15 year olds playing in Western Quebec. Si, shot au but, tout de suite, il réattaque en vitesse. He's seen just about everything in 40 years of coaching. From junior teams in Canada to 18 years coaching in Europe. On his return home in 1999, Jameson was shocked by what he saw. It was like a punch in the nose. It was physical, rough, intimidating. If you don't have three or four big guys, you couldn't even think about winning. Players were afraid to play the game. Jameson went public with his concerns, one of many in the province who pushed for radical change in an effort to reduce fighting and rough play in minor hockey. He got results. Now in Quebec, a team that plays clean by keeping penalties to a minimum is rewarded with an extra point every game. It's called Franjeu, or fair play, and it's as important to winning as goals and assists. I say to my players, you have in your hands the results of the game. We gave the game back to the kids. But this hockey revolution isn't just on ice. In Quebec, hockey is now in the classroom. Sport Etudes schools dot the province, where the emphasis is on education and good coaching. And one of the best teachers is former Team Canada captain, France Saint-Louis. The grand dame of hockey retired a year after the Nagano Olympics. Now, a new generation is benefiting from a veteran's knowledge and experience, an opportunity she never had. Many, many times I say to my kids, I'm jealous, uh, I wish I could be your age today and have the chance to go on the ice every day and uh, practice. Go! They are 12, 14 years old and they really play well and they all uh, aim to, to play one day uh, on the national team. You know? As the century turned, hockey, it seemed, was returning to its roots. Speed and skill had always defined what was great about hockey. And we needed to get it back. With the emphasis not on games, but scrimmaging and trying out new things, being unafraid to fail, as you would when you play on the pond. And we see a whole generation of players that are lighting up the NHL, and they all came out of that self-questioning that happened after Nagano and at the beginning of the 21st century among the hockey establishment. And the beautiful, simple answer was just remember what we already once knew, bring it back. After Canada's disappointment at Nagano, defeat sits heavily on Haley Wickenheiser. But her play was one bright spot in the loss to the United States. I feel the pressure. You guys are making me go last, too. <laughs> and in the fall of 1998, Bobby Clark, the general manager of the Philadelphia Flyers, 
offers her the chance to train with his NHL team. Shades of Manon Rayom playing goal for Tampa Bay, but now no one calls this a publicity stunt. Look here, Haley. Haley first came to love the game on the frozen prairies. Go, Haley. From October to April in Shonovan, Saskatchewan, hockey was a kid's life. Haley's summers were spent at Grandpa's farm, winters on the rink, playing alongside a younger brother and sister and all the other kids who wanted to be Messier or Gretzky. Hockey was the thing that bind us all together. What I loved about the game is you could be creative. You know, you need to be fast, you need to be strong, you need to be skilled. I just love to get out there with the puck and try different things. Many Shonovan slumber parties had an early bedtime because Haley had practice the next day. Hockey might be fun, but it was also the perfect outlet for a driven, determined girl with natural abilities. She grew up playing with the best of them in Shonovan, and thanks to a new charter of rights, that meant with the elite boys' teams. They just treat me like one of the, one of the guys and they don't say anything. In 1990, when she was 12, the family moved to Calgary. To make new friends, Haley joined a girls' team. But her ability soon outstripped the competition and it wasn't long before Haley found herself playing with the boys again on a top-level Bantam team. She won her team's most valuable player award, but was cut from the next team she tried out for. Unfortunately, every time you try to change the establishment, you end up with a big lump on your head from beating it against the brick wall. However, she is pulling up an entire generation of young female players, and we are seeing a quality of game that we had never seen before. At the tender age of 15, juggling high school and hockey, Haley was named to the women's national team in 1994, the youngest player in the team's history. By Nagano, high chair Haley was all grown up, a veteran on a team that had won four world championships. Two years later, Haley was training for another Olympics in another sport. And here is the Olympic debut for Haley Wicken. Playing softball at the Sydney Games in 2000, she became only the second woman to compete in both summer and winter Olympics for Canada. Haley would have made it. Haley's a star. Haley is a gifted uh, athlete who uh, was going to, like Gretzky, could have been a ball player, uh, like Mario, could have been a golfer. Great athletes, uh, it's just in you. I, I don't know why it's in them, but it is. Great athletes also hate to lose. And in the fall of 2000, Haley Wickenheiser was looking for revenge a comeback from the defeat at Nagano in the next Olympics at Salt Lake. Go. One, two, three, four. Mario Lemieux knows all about comebacks, and in that same autumn, he is preparing for his biggest yet. Injuries forced Lemieux out of the game in 1997, but the Penguins, minus Mario, were soon drifting towards bankruptcy. Barely two years after putting his feet up, Lemieux is called out of retirement to once again save hockey in Pittsburgh. When Mario came back to take over ownership of the Penguins, I think it's important to remember, and I'm not, I'm not being cynical, but I think it's important to remember, that the team owed him $30 million in deferred, deferred income. And if, he, if you want to take care of that nest egg, you better come back and, and take care of it. The new owner quickly realized the way to improve the bottom line was to get his best asset on the ice. The back pain that had plagued Lemieux throughout his career eased up in retirement. 
and the idea of a comeback began to take shape. And in December of 2000, Lemieux stepped on the ice, becoming the first owner to play for his team in the history of Major League Sport. The impact was immediate. Pittsburgh sold out the next 33 games. And around the league, everyone wanted to see number 66. But Lemieux had his eyes on another prize. Oh, baby. Yeah, his dossier lacked one thing, if indeed now suddenly NHL players are getting a chance to win an Olympic gold medal. That chance eluded Wayne Gretzky. After retiring in 1999, he took on the pressure-filled job of assembling the next men's Olympic squad. I was on a mission in the sense that I knew I couldn't play again, but I wanted to be somehow involved. The great one turns to his old friend, Mario Lemieux, appointing him captain of Team Canada. And in some ways, I was probably living that thought of a gold medal as a player through him, because we've been friends for a long time. Get some rest and go back at it tomorrow. Heading to Salt Lake, Mario's mission is clear. Reclaim the game for Canada. There's another Team Canada heading to the Olympics at Salt Lake City. The crew that makes the ice at the Northlands Coliseum in Edmonton. Their boss is Trent Evans. And like the athletes here, he and his crew are among the world's best. As they prepare the ice for the Olympics, Evans notices that there is no center ice mark in the Salt Lake logo. I needed a marker to put down on the ice, so it was just placement of it first a dime. But that night, talking to Duncan, my roommate, we both agreed that it would be better off to have the gold of a loony. So next day, I nonchalantly go out to center ice and just place a loony over top of the dime. Because I was responsible for flooding, I was able to cover over the loony with ice. But you could tell visually that it was definitely a Canadian loony. It was a little too obvious for his bosses who ordered Evans to remove it. Instead, he committed a small act of patriotic defiance. Rather than taking the loony out, I put a splotch of paint like I was originally supposed to put as a marker, then ice patched over top of the loony. The loony worked its magic. Both the men's and women's teams made it into the finals. Shortly before the women's gold medal game, Evans let the team in on the secret. It was rah, rah, come on girls, we're skating on top of the Canadian loony. Let's do Canada proud. The Americans, bigger, faster, in a rematch of the last Olympics, Haley and her teammates face off against the Americans. But this time, Canada is the underdog. Most of the men's team gather to watch a tough, penalty-filled game. And it'll be holding against the American forward. A tripping call. Another penalty coming here. But there's another penalty coming here. And Canada going to the penalty box again. You could see that they hated each other out there. Around the net, wrap around, right in front of you! They didn't care about anything. They just went out there and they gave everything they had and, uh, and they were aggressive and uh, that's what I like, you know. It was a great game. Coming into the middle, in the slot, shot, rebound! Wickenheiser scores! The Canadian women triumph with a 3-2 victory and their first Olympic gold medal. Eight power plays in a row and not go nuts and still win the game. I, that, to me, I was the most proud. And um, Haley come over, Wickenheiser come over, and I, 
She's just steaming. Did you get me on right now? It was absolutely atrocious, but you know what? The Americans had our flag on their floor. And the sweat was dripping, obviously we got her on, and she was saying, they threw our flag on the floor in their dressing room. And now I want to know if they want us to sign it. We are so happy. We showed them. I wonder what they're, you know, and she's going on, and, and that there, you just you could just see the, you know, the pride in her. Oh my God, I can't believe we've done this after all we've been through. It was sort of like the greatest moment you could have to win a gold medal and have your, your son there um, to share it with you. Haley's teammates, wanting to acknowledge their good luck charm, almost give away the secret. Wayne Gretzky was up in the crowd on cell phone. He was calling somebody from Canadian hockey, please get the girls away from center ice. We need the secret carried forward for at least our game as well. Later that night, though, the girls did go back out to center ice with their flip-flops on, and they saluted the loony and had a beer with the loony. Match historique depuis le East Center de Salt Lake City. Le Canada affronte les États-Unis. 25 minutes to the opening face-off. Bill McCreary will drop the puck. Hello, Canada, and a very special hello to our armed forces overseas in Kandahar, the Golan Heights. Not since Paul Henderson's goal defeated the Russians in 1972 have the nation's hopes and dreams rested on one team, one game. Canada and the USA. And I was just at home. I was a retired guy, and I was a spectator watching on television. My main image of that last game is the television shot they took of Young Street in Toronto halfway through the game, and it was empty. Downtown Toronto, not a soul. Busiest street in the country, and everybody's inside watching hockey. Jerry Jabson will be watching. He's a recent immigrant from the Philippines, going through his first Canadian winter. Back home, he was an engineer, but in Toronto, he's an assembly line worker, looking to save enough money to bring his family over. <laughs> This Sunday, he and his friends from the factory are among the millions of Canadians gathered around televisions to watch. Or do you call that a ball? And then they shoot it. Is that a puck? Yes, it's a puck. puck. Yeah. For most of them, it's the first hockey game they've ever seen. That's faster than basketball. Because there's KT. Jerry may not know the difference between a cross check and an offside yet, but he knows something more fundamental than the rules. Even the new immigrants like us are beginning to like the game, you know? When you get exposed to a sport, it becomes part of your life, you know? Nice play. Five to get over to Karen Richardson's family is also watching the game. There's always been a hockey bag or two in this house along the banks of the Grand River in southwestern Ontario. My husband played hockey. Both my boys played. The grandkids are now playing hockey. And my mother played hockey. <laughs> I played hockey too. So it's just a normal progression of life that we all played. Karen Richardson's entire family is here for this game. Jamie, who's the best? Karen, let's go! An event that merits a home video recording. And everybody jumps up and down, and they're cheering, and they're hollering, and the kids are jumping around and going crazy. Half a world away, Canadian and American troops gather inside a tent in Afghanistan to watch their teams battle it out on the ice. But 22-year-old Sergeant Lorne Ford has pulled guard duty. Tonight, this squad leader, who is also an avid hockey player and fan, will be manning a foxhole on the camp's perimeter. Out of sight, perhaps, but not out of touch. You could hear the goals being scored from where I was, from the tent. It was something we all wanted to see after 50 years.
from the Motorola's that everybody had, they would say that Canada just scored. And within seconds, everybody knew what was going on in the game. I don't know if it was happening in the American lines or not. I highly doubt it. I mean, we know where hockey lies closer. When the final goal came through, we were up in our seats, jumped up and down. We were cheering. I'm positively sure the whole neighborhood could hear. I was in Scarborough. I heard some cars honking their horn. Boy, those people are really crazy, you know? In my country, they celebrate only in the stadium. Here, people are going to the streets, shouting. While a nation shouted for joy, their team shed tears of relief. Basically, I could have cried for an hour. It was the same feeling that I know every Canadian had. It was the most stressful 10 days of my life, and it was the greatest reward I've ever had in my life, uh, the final day. Mario claimed for Canada the first gold medal in 50 years. The Olympic medalist for men's ice hockey. The first of a new century. And Trent Evans retrieved his talisman from the ice. Canadian hockey had a new legend. We're gonna, you know, I'm gonna do that. We're gonna put it in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Oh, there you go. Yes. A little bit of luck, having a little Canadian on the ice. Women won gold, and men won gold. All right. Just a hockey game, perhaps, but for Lorne Ford, this one will be remembered. They were going nuts. The celebration on the ice. It was just something I remembered because so much is a blur. We had so many other things on our mind. Three months after the game, Sergeant Ford would be badly wounded by a bomb dropped from a U.S. fighter plane. He lost sight in one eye and the use of a leg in the friendly fire incident. Dwara, Jackie! Make it a bit faster! A year after watching the gold medal game, Jerry Jabson was able to bring the rest of his family to Canada. His seven-year-old daughter, Jacqueline, learned to play hockey, and Jerry became, of course, a Leafs fan. For Karen Richardson, the memories of Canada's victory are bittersweet. Her mother died not long after. That game was the last time I got to watch hockey with my mother, who was such an avid fan and a player. She was playing hockey as a woman of 40 at a time in the late 1960s when women her age wouldn't even think of donning a pair of skates. Hockey was her story. And I think history as a whole, rather than event and date-based, is more about people. It's a people's history. Ever since the Winnipeg Falcons ventured overseas in 1920 with a wondrous, furious new game, hockey has been Canada's gift to the world. But for the select few anointed to carry that gift, it's both a blessing and a curse. It's a debt that they owe the nation, and to pay it, they must win the gold. But of course, it's a debt that's never forgiven. Every four years, it's going to come up. Anything less than gold will be considered a failure. So they have to be golden forever. 
And that's the challenge. Three seconds, Canada wins the World Cup of Hockey. And for a brief shining time after Salt Lake City, Canada met that challenge, winning almost every major international title. And Canada has to go home. But not all of them. Are we going to have challenges? Absolutely. We're not going to win every tournament because these countries are getting better every year. But nobody's going to take away the fact that it's our game. That'll never be taken away. It's important for the Russians and the Swedes and the Finns and the Americans to beat us too because of how much we love this game and how much we identify with it. You know you're in a hockey game when you're playing against Canadians. We've been fretting about our place in the hockey universe since 1972. It's going to be a dance, and it has been for 30 years. And we are going to obsess about it, and we are going to fret about it, uh, because it runs deep. We think of it as our game, and the world thinks of it as our game. But they all know, they know that, that, that hockey's home, you know, is, is Canada. They know that. Ten seconds to go. Our game. Words that once rang hollow for women. Yet another work of art in Italy. Now, finally, ring true. There was a time when I first started coaching hockey that the only person who was watching our game was the Zamboni driver. A lot of us actually said over the gold medal, we brought this country together in a way that nothing else had brought this country together before. In, in the 20s, in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, you had leagues, you had um, university teams, but in our national collective memories of hockey, they're not there. They will be there in a while because now we have national teams, we have world championship, there's certain women hockey stars. In February 2003, Wickenheiser became the first woman to ever score a goal in a men's professional league. I would love Haley to make the NHL or someone like Haley. I honestly believe that if Gretzky can step in at 160 pounds, uh, there's going to be a woman. It, it's, it's a toll. It's a physical toll, but it's a toll for half the guys in the hockey. So I'd love to see a woman cross that boundary because we, we are still full of boundaries. Someday, perhaps, there will be a female player's name engraved on Lord Stanley's Cup. Still the most sought after prize in hockey. No other trophy has this personal bond, this bridge with history. And so when Brad Richards returned home to PEI with the cup his team had won in Tampa Bay, it was to the crush of thousands of fans anxious to take ownership, to touch their cup. to have their pictures taken with them. In more than a century, through the Great Depression and two world wars, only once during the Spanish influenza outbreak in 1919 was the Stanley Cup not challenged for. Until 2004, when a lockout of millionaire players by billionaire owners silenced NHL arenas. But Winter's chorus only grew louder. There was a great advantage in that strike, is that many people who will be sitting in their chair, they suddenly stood up in the basement, found their skates, and started playing. From neighborhood rinks, to the revival of long-dead teams with storied pasts, Hockey renewed itself, flourishing in the places that were its roots. And when the NHL, humbled and hopeful, returned a year later, all was forgiven. The, the national drama could continue. Canada had its heroes back. Yeah! 
I think we see in hockey and in hockey players a kind of authenticity. But we see something kind of pure and essential. Uh, honesty, toughness, uh, lack of ego. The ideal, the hockey ideal is of, is Bobby Orr scoring a goal and then skating head down back to the face-off circle without even acknowledging that he's done it. Getting the job done, grace and humility. It's the Canadian way. Born of the struggle to survive this land. Generation after generation. Stride by hard stride, the bond of steel on ice conquered nature's worst. Hockey was Canada's triumph. It turns that formidable, icy surface that Europeans think of as nothing but death into a field of play. It brings together uh, English, French, native traditions, and then it produces a, a longer tale, a longer story across the generations that the game is played. We were the nation that was created when the game was created. It's always neat when you drive across the country and you go from fisheries to textile plants to grain elevators, and next to each is a rink. I know there's a church and a bank, but somehow there's that rink seems like, wow, that, there's a rink in this town. Who would have thought? If you were somebody from another planet and you came uh, you know, onto this earth, I think you'd be absolutely astonished by hockey, of how fast you can really go, of, of how you can maneuver and turn and dance and do all kinds of things. That you're actually doing all of those things on that? that that's incredible. I mean, what an amazing thing. And, 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 wow.